Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, and that includes everybody here who is in the room, but also everybody who's joining online and for the on-demand version of this. Welcome, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, um, my name's Richard Betts. Um, I'm the publisher at Real Asset Media, which we set up in 2019. Thanks very much to Ashurst as well for, for hosting us here. Um, it's a session that we've been running every year here in Frankfurt to look at the, look at the, at the finance side. Super panel coming up, lots to discuss. We're going to start just with a, with a brief kind of presentation as a kind of panel framer um, from Tobias here, um, just to look at some of the... I guess some of the some of the data, some of the things that he's been looking at in terms of the research side, and then we'll pick these up in the in the panel. And it's designed to be an open and relaxed session. So if you've got thoughts, if you've got ideas, questions that you want to ask, please do, um, and we will try to we'll try to pick those up as much as we can. Um, because we're all here together and can, um, then we're going to thank Ashurst for for hosting. Thank the speakers for joining us so we don't do that later. <laughs> and we're going to welcome Tobias. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and good morning to you all. Um, I've prepared some slides just to set up the, the panel discussions we will have later on to kind of frame the, the things we are currently seeing in the, in the market. You can see right now I've uh, overwritten it with acceptance of the new normal. The question is, do we see a new normal? What will this new normal be or look like? Um, so let's basically an open question right now, but some thoughts from my side or from our side. You will see in the next uh, seven or eight slides in the next 15 minutes or so. Why are we here? I mean, those charts probably are quite familiar to, to everybody right now. Um, we've seen a long uh, lasting zero interest rate policy from the ECB come to an end in 2022 with a rapid or historic pace in interest rate rises since then. We've seen uh, rising rates from 0% to currently 4.5%, and that's brought a lot of trouble to real estate markets, to other market segments, of course. Coming from two sides, basically. On one side, other asset types or other uh, kind of uh, investment opportunities, as you can see on the left-hand side here with the German bond yields, for example, currently look quite attractive. If you're looking at US treasuries, it's even more attractive, given kind of the, the higher yields you see there but you have to reflect the hedging costs, of course. But given you can now achieve with a balanced bond portfolio of somewhere around four, four and a half percent, basically, with limited risk and high liquidity, it's the question, do you need 4% or 3% yielding real estate in your portfolio? That's, of course, a significant uh, track on capital raising and stuff like that. I will come to that on the next slide. The second very important factor, of course, is financing costs. We've seen the swap rates go uh, in the direction of 3%. Over the last couple of weeks or months, basically in October, we've seen another increase in swap rates, not the expected slowing down in the, in the um, rising swap rates we have expected a few months ago. So that will drag onto the market and it's making financing more expensive. And that's another factor which limiting real estate activity. As you can see, I've brought some forecasts uh, in the dotted lines on the, on the left-hand side here. Uh, Oxford Economics is quite aggressive. Um, uh, penciling in a lot of rate cuts next year, starting in Q2, coming down to 3%. The market expectation, also the consensus forecast, is more uh, conservative, uh, given rate cuts coming in Q3 and Q4 to around 4%. If we see rate cuts, it can be more aggressive, it can be less aggressive, but what we can pencil in for next year is that we won't come near the 0% we were used over the last 10 years, basically. So that will be a new normal. And also, if you look at the uh, forecast further out, they are all leveling out somewhere around 2% over the next year. So nobody right now, as I'm aware of, is expecting interest rates to come down to zero again over the next couple of years. I already uh, mentioned this, the, the tripod, the capital raising. We've seen uh, slowing down in capital raising activity in Europe and especially in, in Germany over the last couple of quarters. Uh, you see on the right-hand side net inflows into the, the German public funds, uh, which have come down rapidly over the last yeah, month. Um, we have to uh, have in mind that you have a notice period to, if we want to go out of the public funds from uh, in 12 months. So if you want to go out, you have a time lag, and that will only show up in the statistics with the time lag. So we can expect that those uh, numbers will go down even more over the next couple of months, basically turning negative in our view. And that will put pressure on the sell side because they have to kind of provide liquidity to exit their in investors, which are um, already invested in the funds, and also can um, raise difficulties if you uh, have to refinance 
and I will come to that later on, and have to provide uh, more equity into standing investments, and you don't have the equity in the funds anymore. Quick look at the market. I mean, you probably know that from the quarterly reports uh, we and, and other research provider provide uh, to the market. We've seen a rapid slowing in the market since uh, 2022. Uh, we currently are on a uh, level of uh, 2013, 2014 from market activity. So that's pretty slow. Driven mainly, as you can see on the right hand side, by, by the office market. That's, of course, the largest market segment we have in Germany and in Europe and other countries as well. It uh, was hit pretty hard on the price side, of course, but also on the sentiment side. If you look at all the discussions we have about remote work, home office, do we need offices anymore? You can add on the, the WeWork insolvency and stuff like that. That's all creating a picture that's not quite positive and that will not drive a lot of money into the market right now. And that's why we see a huge slowing down in the office market. Logistics, uh, and we don't uh, add uh, residential here, but logistics and residential have seen a slight <coughs> pickup in activity over the last couple of months even. But office is still pretty much um, yeah, um, difficult to, to uh, get a grip on in the market. But what we have seen uh, in terms of price expectations, we have seen a rapid shift. I mean, it doesn't look much here on, on this slide, uh, given the historic length and, and the, and the uh, yield decreases we've seen over the last 10 years. But from uh, Q1 2022, we basically have seen uh, rises of above 100 basis points in every asset type right here, or every sector. Office leads the way with 180 basis points right now. We started at sub 3%, that's cross initial yield, what we've shown here, and we're currently at 4.6% for the yield. So you see that's a lot of movement over a rather short um, time frame. Um, that was catching up um, with the 10-year bond yields. We've saw, uh, seen that before, so we still have not the attractive premium we are used to over the last couple of years, but the premium is more attractive than it was a couple of months ago, at least. Uh, we, as colliers, we expect to, uh, to see a future increases in, in the office yields as well. So we expect them leveling out of uh, at above 5% over the next quarters, cross initial yield, basically somewhere around 5.2, 5.5, uh, depending on what office market you're looking at. In industrial and logistics, you can see a kind of flattening of the red line here. We've seen a rapid increase there as well, but we've seen leveling, um, uh, a leveling out of the um, interest uh, or um, cross initial yields there because market activity is picking up at the market pricing we're currently seeing. Possible to see some, some more increases here, but it's not that much upward pressure as we've seen in the, in the office market right now. If we combine the yields with the uh, rent development, we have a, a few on the prime capital values. Just for example, I brought office and industrial here with me. Um, we've seen prices going up since basically 29. That was driven by strong rental growth in most of the markets, but also, of course, uh, mainly driven by yield compression we've seen over the last couple of years, given the zero interest rate policy of the ECB. And then we had a, the, the point in 2022 when yields started to rise rapidly and rental growth couldn't, uh, com uh, couldn't um, yeah, put in weight against that. So we have seen prices coming down rapidly on the office market. We're currently standing at around 40% uh, lower than peak value. Um, there. In the industrial logistics markets, it's rather around 20%. But you can see that's the price uh, level we've seen uh, in the office market at least in 2018. So you can see if you bought a building in 2019, 2020, 2021, and you financed it on conditions that were then market standard, you probably are running in trouble if you want to refinance that building because the value now is not the value you bought then. And that's not reflected in different interest rates, that's just the value kind of view on the, on the property. Logistics, it's uh, a little bit uh, different. We have seen uh, yields bottoming out in our chart there or topping out in the chart. And we've seen really strong rental growth in logistics over the last couple of quarters as well. So we've seen 8% to 10% in the top cities per year. And that, of course, is a different counterweight to yield development than in the office market where we've seen 2, 3, 4% at the most uh, rental growth. So the question arises, of course, what does that do over the next couple of years? What can we expect in, time, in terms of kind of uh, relevance for the real estate market? What's happening over the next couple of years? 
to, to analyze that, we did a kind of short uh, analysis in May um, where we looked at the transaction volume we have seen in the years 2018 to 2021, what kind of volume was invested in German commercial real estate markets. And we looked at the conditions, uh, financing conditions that were in place at that time. And then given that real estate financing usually is uh, secured for five, seven, ten years. We did a, a split on that. We simulated um, financing running out over the next ten years, or in that case until 2030, and then estimated given swap rate uh, forecasts and forecasts on, on margins and stuff like that, what kind of refinancing conditions would be in place in 25, 26, 27. So that's obviously it's an educated guess. <laughs> uh, those numbers <laughs> change, but it's kind of a yeah, we try to kind of grasp the market and see what would be coming or what could be coming. And of course, that's the main numbers I'm showing here. We can run scenarios on that just to see what kind of uh, bandwidth we, we can expect. But the main thing uh, I wanted to show here is we, we did an update for this presentation last week, uh, given the new swap rates we, we've seen right now. So in May, we used the May swap rate forecast from Oxford Economics. Now we're using the November forecast. And we increased the initial yields. In May, we expected initial yields to top out somewhere around 4.7, 4.8%. Now we expect initial yields to top out around 5.2, 4, uh, 5.3%. So that's another increase of uh, 60, 70 basis points at least. And then we uh, run, uh, run the numbers again. And you can see um, uh, already in May, we had a, a debt gap, uh, as we uh, called it, of about 28 billion euros over the next couple of years. So that's capital what, uh, that was financed a few years ago that we don't get financing if we wanted to refinance, which we have to kind of put equity in <coughs> to solve the problem. Running the numbers uh, last week, uh, the gap increased to 31 billion euros. So that's driven mainly by the uh, swap rate forecast, which is higher and lasting on longer than expected in May, but also, of course, driven by further yield increases and therefore further um, price corrections we, we expect over the next couple of years. Is it the European market or the German? That's the German market, yeah. Sorry. And we can see here um, 2023, okay, it's already in the books, sure, uh, or mostly in the books, but we can see for next year the gap here is uh, uh, around a billion, which we expect to be more of a gap than we expected in May. That's significant given right now we're seeing kind of 25, if we're lucky, uh, billion euros transaction volume this year. If you uh, subtract uh, 1 billion as a debt gap, which came additionally since May, that's a significant track on market activity, which we expect. <coughs> and that will, of course, kind of uh, create problems on a property level if you have to refinance it, but also on the market level, given the liquidity and the forecast for transaction volumes we will see over the next couple of years. You also can see that it's a problem that will uh, track mainly into 2026, um, given the, the uh, assumptions we did on five-year, seven-year, ten-year um, uh, financing uh, terms. And then it will drop off because most of the bulk of the activity in 2018, 2019 will have been refinanced then. And then we're coming to slower market development. We will update that over the next couple of quarters, looking at the activity in 22, 23, and stuff like that to see if there's coming. But given the low activity, especially in 23 and in the later half of 22, that's not much of a debt gap that will build up there because it's just too, uh, too few deals that are relevant there. If you look at sectors, um, that's probably not surprising. Office is dominating the picture because the office market <coughs> has the, the highest market share in the years we have analyzed here from 2018 to 2021, but also because the office market is under <coughs> pressure uh, more than other sectors, for example, uh, uh, industrial and logistics or food retail because we have uh, seen stronger price corrections. And also, <coughs> sorry, we see different sentiment in the market, of course. So office market will dominate that sector with, uh, yeah, two-thirds of the share. Logistics, a little bit. Um, high street retail, yeah, of course, um, that's still a lot of pressure. Not as much as office because it's a smaller market segment. And of course, we have seen price corrections in the high street retail market over the last couple of years. That's not a new theme that's basically going on then since 2018, 2019. So that's not a new, new development here. But that's the picture we are, we're seeing. So we expect to see a track on market activity resulting from the debt financing gap. We expect to see problems on property levels if you have to refinance properties and don't have enough equity on hand because fund investors are pulling their money out or you can't raise new capital. And that, of course, will uh, put pressure on existing investors. That also offers, of course, opportunities for new investors, for alternative uh, providers and stuff like that. We can come to that uh, surely in the panel later on. 
if you look at those uh, kind of takeaways, what are the, the impulses we can take away of that um, for, for the following panel discussion? So on the one hand, of course, I, I stressed that enough, I think we expect significant debt shortfalls over the last over the, the next coming years. We also expect limited equity in the market for the next couple of years. If you look at capital raising service, for example, they are all showing that market activity not only in the active investment markets so of who's buying properties, but also who's collecting funds to potential buy properties is slowing down significantly. And if you show, uh, if you look at who's raising money right now, it's at the price point or at the target yield we currently don't see in the market. So to put that money to work, we would have to see another kind of price correction to uh, achieve the target returns of those investors who are currently actively raising money. Increasing equity requirements, of course, if you don't have debt to refinance your uh, investments, you kind of have to put additional equity into the market. Um, but is there enough equity out there? That's the big question, of course, over the next couple of years. And what kind of equity is available for what kind of sectors? Also, we have to look, I think, differently at sub-markets, at property types, and stuff like that. So we have seen a lot of different perspectives we have to, to adjust for here. And what alternative financing options are available? If you see, okay, senior lenders <coughs> moving out of difficult positions maybe, or are more hesitant to kind of do, do new financing, um, we have to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. Right now, market activity is so slow that you don't need a lot of financing in the market. So even if you want to finance, you probably don't find a lot of options to finance because market activity is barely there market activity is picking up for a lot of sectors and also you need kind of alternative financial uh, financial financing options for kind of troubling loans and stuff like that the question is what kind of investors are filling the gap and at what conditions are those conditions economical so of course you can go to an alternative lender to a private debt fund or something like that but does that make sense for your core investment that's another question of course and then the last point from my side we expect the increasing polarization we see on the equity side or on the market as a whole, uh, <coughs> also on the debt side. So which properties are still being financed in the future? We have the ESG themes going around in the market. So everybody wants to buy ESG fit buildings or at least manage to green buildings. Are there enough uh, debt partners for those kind of investments? And what's happening to the market that's not ESG driven? Are there that option for those kind of investments in the future? Is anybody financing Class B offices in Class C locations? That's the big question. Not which property types will be financed as a whole, but what kind of niches and segments will find debt and won't find debt over the next couple of years. Let's let's just start with some introductions and, and let's start with you, Dirk, as host at, at that end. Just a brief introduction yeah, um, of, your, of yourself does, and the company. Does this work? It should work. Ah, is it working? Perfect, yeah. Um, yeah my, my name is Dirk Opitz. Um, I'm a partner um, um, at Ashurst. Um, until two weeks ago, I'm, I was also managing partner of the German offices, but I'm, I'm relieved of that role now, so I can focus on my business, uh, which is real estate finance. And, but on behalf of Ashurst, we are it's great, great to have you all here. <laughs> great, thank you. Um, Etienne. Yeah, thanks. I'm a Associate Director uh, for Edmund Rothschild, where we have launched a real estate debt fund um, four years ago. So we're kind of a new kids on the block with regards to alternative lending. Um, we have collected over the last uh, couple of years uh, 350 million euro in, in capital, which we have deployed up to date. Uh, I think we're at a deployment rate of 70% um, and we are about to launch our new fund um, with a target volume of six, 600 million euro. Um, yeah, and happy to be here. <laughs> Great, thanks. Anna? I'm with uh, Siberia Loan Services uh, since 2015. Um, built up a team of uh, four people there and uh, we do loan servicing for um, UK and German markets for all um, classic lenders and alternative lenders and uh, funds. <coughs> Great, Marcus. Yeah, Marcus Bern. I'm heading the uh, origination unit for international investors at Berlin HIP. We are purely German mortgage bank lender, active also in selective European markets. And since one and a half years now, almost one and a half years, part of the ABBW group and combined as a portfolio you know, to the biggest lenders to real estate here in Germany at least. 
And you're all white as well. <laughs> Great. And Tobias, you didn't introduce yourself, so yeah, you, you I can, can do now. That. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm co-heading the, the German research team at, at Colius. We are a team of 20, 20 people covering all the relevant top seven markets and also industrial and residential with all teams in, in Germany. Okay, great. Um, let's start maybe with you, um, Marcus. One of, one of the points was, you know, new normal in interest rates. Um, what's your kind of take on that? I suppose, what's your overall <coughs> outlook at, at the moment? And do you see that as a, as a new normal for interest rates as well at the moment, where we are now, or let's say one or two points off that? In former times, 6% was the normal uh, around that mark. Everybody made his assessment. Uh, and uh, the interest rate was oscillating above or slightly below that. To have a, a year-long uh, zero interest rate policy was, was fueling the warning signs there, there that this is just uh, bubbling up the, uh, the, the market and the price uh, finding there. 4% um, in old time average is still low. Um, the only issue here was the increase came just too quick for the industry and that, that just uh, collapsed everything. So build stabilization, let the inflation come in at a, an acceptable range around that mark will be the, the new normal, what, what is to be expected. So it's, a, it's about 4% about there, maybe a bit low, a bit, bit higher. And, and what's everybody else's take on that? Do we, do we see that the interest rates at the approximately that kind of rate? What's, what's the view? Yeah, I think, um, you know, from my perspective, looking at the current market, and uh, we've heard that from the presentation that uh, Tobias gave us, you know, a question in there was interest to be higher for longer. And uh, I think, you know, when we, when we have a look at the market, we see added complexity right now with the war in Ukraine, with the war between Israel, Israel and Hamas, uh, now still trying to reach post-COVID normalization. I think all of these factors uh, are unknown factors, how they will impact inflation. And therefore, we, we cannot estimate right now what, you know, central banks, uh, how they will behave. I mean, the tightening, tightening we saw was quite aggressive in the last couple of quarters. Um, but I would, I would probably uh, agree with, uh, with the view from, from Colliers and, and, and Tobias, you know, that interest will be high or higher for longer and that it will uh, add additional stress to, to the economies. Uh, you know, shrinking consumer spending and also a corporate landscape that is uh, being penalized or harmed by, uh, by high refinancing scenarios. And uh, I guess, Anna, from your perspective, how, how does that then play out, would you say, within, you know, in the markets? And, and are there differences, I guess, between the perspectives of, uh, you know, what you're seeing here in terms of the German lenders, let's say, and other lenders from the UK or, you know, international US lenders? What we note is that, for example, the term of a loan is different than it was before. No one goes for like four or five years um, to maturity and rather takes two or three just to wait until the next uh, development of the market and then um, rather taking another extension of maybe 12 or 18 months. And of course, while being in the loan, uh, we do see different um, covenants. We don't see the hard covenants that there were before, like on LTVs or on ICRs, um, but rather um, cash rep levels, which are soft covenants, just to keep the um, property stable and uh, to keep the cash in the um, facility. Okay, good. Um, and Dirk, I wanted to pick up with you. You're obviously tracking the regulatory side. Um, and <coughs> I know yesterday by the, from the ECB there was also some concerns around particularly the commercial real estate side. Um, so I suppose what's your, what's your take on yeah. that um, and how influential is that? Um, um, I mean, we are focusing now on, on reference rate, which is, which is right, but I think we also have to look at capital requirements of the banks. And so what the, what the regulator did in the last crisis, at the beginning of COVID, the capital requirements for banks were relieved, which enabled banks you know, to, to sit through the crisis, you know, to do short-term extensions and, um, and you know, to wait um, how, how, how you know, the market evolves. And, uh, but now, already end of last year, the, um, um, uh, the, the regulator made crystal clear you know, this, you know, the um <coughs> that time is over now. We've um, um, there are no there's no, there are no softening on capital requirements. So um, you know, in addition, it, it's a bit like, and I don't want to be too pessimistic. I consider myself as a half a glass half full person, but in, in it, it looks a bit like a perfect storm. You know, you have the reference rate at the same time, um, the um, the um, 
uh, capital requirements um, for the banks are not are, are, are being tougher to meet. And then now one could say it, 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 it's th that's the hour of the of the alternative investors for sure or for the non-bank <coughs> lenders for the debt funds. But here also the regulator. I mean, just recently. Um, 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 Impose new rules that now, now there's the minimum retention rules for for the funds and so so also on on their side so I, I think the question is you know where's gonna where's the, all the all the debt we need gonna come from okay well that's an interesting and large point so <laughs> <laughs> let's I mean it would be inter I mean one of the questions you posed there to Beers as well was you know is there enough liquidity here in order to be able to service the debt that's going to arrive um, I mean it'd be interesting from your point of view, Marcus, what's what's your sense of, I, I guess, that point about there being pressure on all sides, in a way, is that actually helpful, do you think, at the moment? Or do you think that's going to create more problems, or will it actually just drive everything through more quickly, and so therefore transactions can come back to normal? What's your sense of that? I think it's a, it, it, it's a cleansing going in through into the market, so that will accelerate the, the, the cleaning out there. And uh, that should also be be done. So this is in general. So is there sufficient lending? Was the other question? So well, over the over the almost ten years of uh, of yield compression, uh, our average book uh, senior lending is up to six percent loan to value, and most of that stuff, in average, our book value went down to below fifty uh, loan to value overall. If now the the, uh, the uh, values decrease again, the, the loan to values go up to the 60. That is as such in general doesn't harm. Uh, the most more problematic side is that the uh, the debt yield uh, discussion is there sufficient liquidity out of the rents <coughs> to pay for the interest rate. And there we also said uh, our policy was always you have to at least have six percent at exit to be prepared <coughs> if the interest rate is is rising. So that uh, was the limiting factor for, for lending. And once in a while, we only could offer 40% loan to value. I said, but it's crazy for that kind of asset. That yeah, but liquidity-wise, you cannot afford more when the exit and the interest rate is, is at that level. So from that side, is, is more the critical point. Is that the debt capacity is there. Is the cash flow there to serve it? OK, interesting. Does anybody else have a? I would I would agree a hundred percent. I mean, you know, in, in in current market times, the complexity about lending is really uh, w what's the right debt sizing in a market where you have an ongoing yield shift, where values are anticipated to fall further. You know, financing markets are, are slow at the moment. Banks, in a way, behaving sluggish because uh, of the complexities we're seeing. Um, so, so we're you know we, we need to ask ourselves as a lender um, you know to to have a to have a focus on the cash flows and what's really the debt yield and the ICR we are believing um, you know to to come out of that deal again um, and and I think that uh, you know it all tends towards one direction which is a, a massive funding gap that we're soon about to face and uh, we heard it today from Tobias. Um, and, and then, you know, the question is, is there sufficient liquidity? F liquidity from the equity side, I think we're seeing that, you know, a lot of fundraising campaigns uh, at the moment are not successful. Um, but for credit strategies, I think it's, it's a bit different. You know, I see, I see basically two types of capital movements there. The one type, uh, which is a bit more conservative, um, credit strategies that are offering rather senior loans or whole loans uh, benefiting from higher base rates. The other side being uh, more flexible, um, you know, that can provide financing solutions across the capital stack from senior loans up to mezzanine capital, even preferred equity. Um, and I think they are preparing for these kind of, uh, for, for this funding gap. Uh, and I have one, one number in my head. Uh, uh, which which uh, came from a study um, on a pan-European scale. It was issued by AEW uh, last year. I think it was updated yeah. this year again. And they mentioned a funding gap uh, of 93 billion euro. And I think uh, for six European countries. <coughs> and I think uh, alternative lenders are, are, you know, preparing for this kind of funding gap at the moment where senior banks are partially withdrawing due to higher capital requirements and the overall lending activity is becoming uh, yeah, more uh, defensive, I would say. 
same, same, same opinion that um, due to regulatory requirements on the senior lenders, how do the alternative lenders get more chance um, to step in and also based on the currently higher rates which um, become normal, uh, the MES rates or any other are not so high at all. So that they <coughs> the, the gap between the rates that we saw earlier is just lower and lower so that uh, people get used to it. Okay. Yeah. Maybe at the same time what I have to mention, um, I mean, uh, you know, funding gap sounds everything good and I think, you know, there was a wise man who once said, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. Uh, so, you know, from the capital movement I'm seeing, I think uh, GPs are preparing for that kind of opportunity. At the same time, we are now in a new world, right? So the, the loan underwriting has, has become different from what we have seen one and a half years ago meaning that uh, the, the stress testing is, is harsher. Uh, you know, it's an, for, for example, in our case, it's, it's really an equity style underwriting. So we want to see at what point is the equity underwater and then at what point is our debt underwater. And on that basis, you know, uh, with that, those haircuts, uh, we, we obviously are applying certain credit enhancements in our loan structuring to protect part of our, well, our principal in the end. So I, I think that that has changed massively, and uh, of course it's uh, it's obvious that uh, in most of the deals more equity has to come in. Mm. Okay, well, good. Has not changed that much. We we do that for more than a couple of years. I mean that was always the the part. Sh sure, the, but the scenario of that and being the other one just to mm -hmm. banks being sluggish. What will you do to a loan which was generated five years ago has still a, a, another five years to mature, and you're locked in at two percent. Well, yeah. w what shall you do? Uh, absolutely, and and this is also why I think it's important, you know, to to look exactly at what sectors can you can you lend towards right now, where you have sufficient liquidity, where you have, you know, sufficient lease up potential, and then, uh, you know, one one thing from what I saw from banks, I mean, they were always focusing on core assets, cash shielding assets, um, and in my opinion, those assets were hit harshly by the ongoing yield shift because there's no reversionary potential. And uh, I think that for alternative lenders who are a bit more flexible in, in, their, in their lending behavior, you know, going for example in value add risk, um, obviously you know, the nice thing about value add is uh, that you have reversionary potential and can partially offset the ongoing yield shift. But it's important that the sponsor performs on his business plan, right? Because yep. uh, if he doesn't perform, then you end up uh, with <laughs> a value-add <laughs> asset. And then <laughs> Handing it over to the <laughs> mess provider. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, that's the important thing, I, I, I think, f from, a, from an alternative lending perspective, um, that you need to discipline, on the one hand, your sponsor that he achieves certain milestones by tight covenant sets, tight milestone sets, uh, tighter loan structuring. Um, and, and, you know, on, on the other hand, having a, a cautious uh, or disciplined underwriting um, in place because uh, some alternative lenders haven't done it over the last couple of years, uh, you know. Okay. Uh, what's it, what is different to a bank underwriting then? <laughs> because that's the exactly what we uh, do. Well, I think, you know, the, the risks are different. So yeah, obviously the, the risk the parameter, but, yeah, exactly. but the underwriting, the and underwriting the business um, plan and stuff does the same thing we do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, Marcus, at the moment, obviously there's very limited transactions. Um, so are you being restricted by the fact that nobody's asking you to lend? I mean, so is there money, but you're just not, nobody's coming to you? Um, or is it that actually there's going to be more of a focus on refinancing, restructuring some of the loans that you've got? And because of the change in values, that limits what you can do in terms of new business. I suppose, where are you in that scale? Well, usually banks need new business to substitute the money which is refinanced, repaid, uh, amortized or whatsoever. Um, we've seen, as I said earlier, a lot of people have taken out long-term money and still a lot of uh, time to mature um, on, on low interest rates. So the repayment wave is not there. And we see all of the mortgage banks here have built up their book in the time. Have not seen that decrease to the year end, all of a sudden a repayment of a couple of billions or whatever. Um, what is limiting, in fact, is, is the regulatory environment and need to prepare for potential downgrades of your loan. And if there's less repayment 
the risk weighted assets of the bank are not freed up, so you need to build up reserves, and that limits the, the new business you can uh, <coughs> undertake. And it was clear that in this year, and maybe also next year, there will not be many transactions being new. So that's why the focus is not on generating new business, but making sure that the book is safe. And, and how difficult, I mean, Anna, you'll be looking at this, but how difficult then is it to get financing at the moment? What's the, what's the situation? You know, is it more challenging than it was before? Or is there, in fact, because there's less activity? Uh, I think it's, it is more challenging just because everyone is more cautious than they were um, in the earlier days um, and look um, in, in more detail at uh, what the cash flow is, what the prospects are. Um, and looking at the German market, and we saw it in the um, JLL research reports that uh, something like an average of 25% has gone down on the new business for all German markets. Um, we do see that UK and US lenders still lend, uh, but also on different conditions um, than the Germans do. And they are more um, riskier than the Germans, uh, just based on the um, Baffin and everyone else who looks after it. And more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it'd be interesting, um, Dirk, just just from you to to pick up. You know, that would suggest what we've seen from Tobias would suggest that there are going to be more restructurings, more issues around that. Is that something that you're <coughs> already seeing, or that you're expect to be seeing? You know, again, where are we in that cycle? Um, you know, one one other aspect. Um, um, <coughs> we haven't discussed yet is also you know most banks have reduced their restructuring departments and you know over the last 10 years we didn't need them and so so um, we do have the feeling that that there's a you know a bit of um, a lack of capacity for to deal with uh, difficult engagements and then also what we haven't touched upon is it, I mean we have to look at real estate developments I mean if you where you stand Richard if you turn around we can you can see two properties of Signa one they haven't even started to build on the on the Opernplatz, and one mm. at Hauptwache, where who who knows whether they finished that. And so, <laughs> so um, um, we've um, there also. I mean, those banks who finance development ha have also here a big you know, uh, risk in the book, and which 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 <laughs> uses a lot of capacity um, in, in the banks because you know um, I mean the, the the developments have been hit like. Multiple times, it's 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 um, the higher energy cost, it's it's uh, the, the the supply, and 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 so forth, and so so. Um, but on coming back to your question, yes, we are seeing that more and more, but not as much as the, our panel would suggest. <coughs> so so um, so I think um, so we're doing a couple of developments, couple, uh, a couple of restructurings, couple of insolvencies, but not not massively. So, so uh, my, my personal feeling is the wave is still coming. Okay, so, and when you say still coming, do you mean in 2024? Do you mean in 2025? No, no, earlier, earlier, next, beginning, beginning of next year. Okay, so we've got that to look forward to after Christmas. <laughs> <so that's laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know as, a, as, a, as, a, as a lawyer, we're sort of agnostic, you know, whether it goes up or down, it just has to go in one direction, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, okay. maybe I can take up that point because uh, I'm not sure if, if, if it's going to be obviously we, we don't have the crystal ball at hand but uh, what I'm seeing is that a lot of senior lend or lenders and overall I don't want to <laughs> just uh, put the senior lender in the focus lenders uh, also alternative lenders uh, are, are right now I in a phase where they're aiming to push the loan maturities towards 2025 um, by either prolongations if or extensions, if, if they can, if they can, if they yeah. can because they totally don't want to be hit by that kind of market, by that kind of yeah. refi market. And you know, if you look at the forward curves, you think uh, interest rates are going to be, you know, better in 2025. So it's going to be easier in terms of refinancing, especially from, you know, from an ICR perspective. Um, but you know, from a time frame, yeah, I, w I would see because right now we don't see a lot of distressed debt. Yeah. We don't see a lot of uh, non-performing portfolios and uh, yeah, yeah. There, are no, there are no big portfolios in the market exactly. or, or, or envisage that, that banks start to sell loans. Yeah. Uh, no, no. I, 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 I totally no. agree and if, if, if lenders can, they would try to, to extend for now. Yeah. 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 
Yep, I'm going to set a rule. You don't need to ask. Uh, so at, at the same time, it. I think and the same for everybody here. If, if we just look at the total different side on the career market, where people are um, hired at the moment, um, I see that a lot of alternative lenders are hiring underwriters so that they get this set prepared to get the lending out and on the for example on the lender side like a Dega and Halaba they do increase their people on the workout and restructuring departments. Okay, Again so being prepared for the next uh, 12 and 18 months. But which also maybe results from the fact that they've reduced their capacities. In, in certainly, the certainly it hasn't been uh, the case in the last 10 yeah. years but now but, but going, it's going back. It's also in line with what we're seeing from a capital movement perspective. And I mentioned that earlier when I talked about the credit strategies and dry powder doesn't seem to decrease for credit strategies. Um, I, I think they're well preparing for this kind of mm -hmm. vintage, you know, for those opportunities where they're onboarding the people with the right skills, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of underwriting, but having also the capital at hand to provide this kind mm -hmm. of flexible mm -hmm. financing solutions. So anyone in the room who was involved in restructuring previously, now may be your time again, perhaps, who knows. <laughs> um, good. Tavis, you asked a, a number of questions at the end of those. Um, so what were some of your answers to them, or do you not have answers to them? What's, what's your take on some of the things you've heard from here as well? <coughs> no, I, I mean, clear answers are difficult to come up with, so I don't know. Right? So, I mean, from the alternative lenders' perspective, I think... Uh, we, we mentioned a lot of points, but we, what we can't forget right now is that a lot of the alternative lenders are, are themselves in kind of trouble if you have existing funds and you are on the mezzanine side or stuff like that. So uh, alternative lenders have been quite active over the last couple of years, raising money in Germany and investing into development. And yeah. as Dirk just mentioned, that's especially a kind of difficult uh, role right now. So uh, it's, it, I don't have an answer, <laughs> to be honest, but it's uh, one kind of uh, point I, I wanted to stress and I, we have to look at if all the alternative lenders who have capital to be the, I will not, not say the savior, but one of the most important players in the next couple of years, some of those players probably won't get the chance to do that. And you mentioned um, development as well earlier. It would be interesting just to get people's views on development finance because for sure, I mean, if some of these are looking difficult and underwater, that's going to be the case across Europe. Um, so is that area <coughs> going to be the one that suffers most? What's, what's, does anybody want to give a view on the development side? Yeah, maybe I can take up that one. Um, I mean, the, the market had been extremely challenging for most of the you know, developers uh, facing cost overruns, facing uh, supply chain problems, facing high interest rates, everything dilutive for their business plan. Um, what I'm seeing lately in the market is that uh, you know, some developers uh, seem to again uh, be able to um, contract on a fixed price uh, basis, which gives us a bit of more comfort. Um, I think in our case, it's, it's really, I would say, uh, in our filtering process, the filtering process has become much, much harsher, uh, much tighter. We're, we're applying usually, uh, you know, several criteria. One of the main criteria is, for example, you know, what kind of span sponsor you're partnering up with, uh, has a sufficient track record, sufficient liquidity buffer to, you know, also uh, realize that project on an, I'm not saying all equity basis, but if something, uh, you know, goes south, then he needs to uh, take over, eventually also complete it with, with his own equity. Second criteria is, uh, what kind of sectors and assets are you looking for? And we're seeing massive fundamental changes right now. Uh, so you, you as a lender want to bet on the right horse, right? Uh, where, you, where you see, uh, what's the business plan? Um, is it a, you know, compliant with the green transition we're seeing right now, compliant with technological changes? So all of that taking into account, and then, uh, you know, one of the last criteria is uh, your loan structuring. I mean, uh, you're structuring now way tighter than one and a half years ago. I mentioned that initially um, in, in one of the statements, you know, having tighter covenant sets, having tighter milestone sets, asking definitely for more equity in the deal. The times where you saw, you know, capital stack, which is financed up to 85% LTV, uh, which is sometimes even above 100% LTC, 
these are definitely over. You know, as an alternative lender, we still look at development because there's still potential. Uh, but we are way more defensive and asking for more equity. But, you know, can I add to that development point? And from now on, I'm on a, everything I say, I want to give it a positive spin now. That, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but looking at development, I wouldn't, it's, <coughs> a lawyer would always say it depends. But, but then there is also upside to it. I mean, you have a 90% completed development. It's, it's ESG compliant, state of the art. And you know it's worthwhile putting resources, putting more money in because I mean you do see the upside potential. Whilst you have an office building which is you know it's, it's a couple of years old, I mean it's it's fully rented. I mean what? <coughs> where's the active asset management? You can really do. Where's the upside potential? Why is the development? So I would, I mean there are um, probably development there. Are, I wouldn't say every development is going to strand now because. There are, are those where it's simply worthwhile spending time and money on it mm -hmm. because I mean there, there's there's some fantasy in it. Yeah. But at the same time, you you have to admit that uh, you know <coughs> some developers who are coming from the old world, they're facing massive problems because they uh, you know overpaid, yeah. having yeah. Lot, lots of price volatility and uh, uh, so when when I talk to some local developers I see it's you know the equity is, is basically bust it's it's wiped out yeah. then it's the question to the lender do you want to finance a deal where you know the equity is already underwater of, of course you don't want to um, let's talk a little bit about um, I guess the 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 sectors where we do see that opportunity and where people are looking because that's something that that's come up um, I mean Marcus maybe maybe starting with you in terms of being open for financing, what are the things that you are actively looking at? Which sectors do you see as either more resilient or where you still see an attractiveness in, in terms of, of lending? Well, we still throughout, we, ha we have not much changed the, the strategy. We have reduced the uh, exposure to office in the, in the target portfolio um, by some basis points or by, by some percentage. Um, um, office still has their their needs, um, particularly the modern offices. Uh, there will be dated ones which which have other needs than uh, <laughs> than uh, come to that later maybe. Um, but that's still a sector we are we active. Uh, residential portfolios, uh, yeah, trouble there. All this complexity in building rights and and, uh, and costs and and redu limited rents you you are allowed to ask for that brings developments to a halt or, or will not be further pursued. This is either Javon or others that we don't do that at the moment, does not pay. So we would still do that, but there's, there's limited uh, availability or, or, or requests out there. Um, on the other hand, that the more developers go bust and the more um, transactions are not done, <laughs> sets free capacities for the others. And that's where you come back to, you can get the general contractor again, you can get uh, handcraft again because before it was just yeah. it was just empty, yeah. so that is it's the cleansing factor which I said we come back to a normal, where you also can work out. It was just too much at the same time. Yeah. Maybe to add on this, uh, I think it's uh, it, it's hard to say. You know, right now to select certain <coughs> sectors and assets where where you feel comfortable with uh, lending towards. I think mm -hmm. on a more broader view, uh, it it uh, you know. You need to have an asset where you see sufficient liquidity once you need to refinance. And uh, I, I mentioned that uh, before. You know, you, you you obviously have to have a good view on wh what's the fundamental change. Um, and and for example, you know, if you see an office asset in a B location that uh, has no reversionary potential, uh, that is maybe a, a brown asset, so to say, and uh, you don't see a business plan where they will convert it into a green asset. I think you know it's it's uh, you don't want to commit to those kind of assets as a lender right now, and uh, there I see liquidity is drying out. But you know every asset that has reversionary potential, where you're comfortable in terms of the business plan, the sponsor can achieve on it. I think uh, you know you, you you still have uh, financing uh, solutions available. And uh, I'll just pick that point up in terms of the you know obviously ESG. A huge element across the across the sector. Um, so, if there is that transition plan available, um, you know, is that the area that everybody is going to be focusing on? Can finance be 
you know, less a passive and more an active part of that transition, I suppose. How do you see that? I mean, I know, Marcus, you're doing quite a lot of work in, in that area on the sustainability side. Um, I guess, what are, what, are some of the, what are some of the challenges and how active can you be in, in supporting the transition that's needed? Well, we can create product which, which supports that by um, subsidizing part of the margin, by uh, allowing for temporary vacancies while the, the, the offices or the property is converted into, into the new. Um, but can we accurately push transactions? No, we have to really see that in the market something's happening. If somebody brings a transaction, somebody agrees to a transaction and, and then looks out for the loan. The, the transaction must be there and then the bank can kind of, I cannot push a transaction uh, on my side. I can support it in a certain way, uh, <coughs> offering a, a transformation loan, a green loan, a tax summary mm -hmm. come from uh, a loan, which, whichever is then uh, reclassified. <coughs> and some investors really want that and ask for that. Um, also for their own records and for their own in, in investment uh, reportings, uh, and that's what we support. Yes. Okay, good. I, I would agree. I mean, uh, you, you cannot take over the the active role as a lender, obviously, because there's a sponsor, there's an asset manager. They are in charge of you know achieving the milestones. But what you what you need to do as a lender is to anticipate, right? And you have to uh, you know review the underwriting and see whether those milestones are realistic. And uh, you know, <coughs> have a certain ESG grid. Uh, what you can apply in due diligence, but also most post monitoring. You know, uh, have a loan structuring in place, a loan documentation in place, where the sponsor can benefit if he achieves certain milestones. For example, by having a flexible margin ratchet, You mentioned it, or you know, at the same time, if he doesn't achieve it, uh, is being penalized. Um, uh, but, but taking over an active role, I think uh, you want to avoid that uh, as a lender. You, you need to anticipate, obviously. You need to have the structure, set up the structure accordingly um, from, from an ESG perspective. Okay, good. And Dirk, from the regulatory side, um, I guess how is that driving this sort of green transition side? Um, is it creating more challenges than positives? What's, what's the situation? Ooh, um, a complicated one by the sound. Complicated <laughs> one because, because I on on um, that's a very that's that's very far from the regulatory side to the um, um, to really um, you know a, a green lending. I mean there, there there's limited support, but I I don't think that's I mean that's not a regulatory driven topic at the will moment. Will come. It will come. It will come because is that all banks are required by July last year for every new business to have an ESG questionnaire in what form or so ever, and for all the book they have by July this year. Whatever the result of this question is, uh, and what we do with it, is yet not determined, yeah? but we have to have one. Yeah, so uh, whether a rating of 1.2 and 1.8, was, what does it do, is not yet there. But, but that will come later on that the regulator says, yeah. everything which is built above 1.5 or whatsoever, um, need more squared assets and the other one will be benefiting from that. So th th like this you can steer, funding into the sectors and support like that the the conversion and and you know what we what we then see in the transactions i mean there's really no standard for real standard for a green loan yet i mean we have the lma green loan principles mm. but uh, but then you know sometimes you put them into a document um, and, um, but at the same time don't penalize non-compliance you, you know the, the the borrower can comply but doesn't have to comply and and it's it's um, i mean as you say i mean we the, the, the standards still have to evolve and at the moment our feeling it's, it's a bit erratic um, um, and sometimes we see transactions where, where, where it's, de where it's um, recognized in the margin so that, that the, the relief is passed on to the borrower but often it's just put into the document but it doesn't really yet fit on the transaction. So, As we said in our call, we see the clauses but everything else is just the best effort and endeavor yeah. because there are no standards if, if at, at all. all. If at all. It's not yeah. even a best effort and endeavor, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it will come. So at the moment it's there in the clause, but actually you don't need to do anything about it. No. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's coming. It's coming. Okay, so at the moment there's information like, gathering. Like e ESG was, was, I think last year or year before, the, the big topic I've already talked about today, it's, it's part of the analysis, part of the underwriting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nothing special about it anymore. 
Yeah, and, and also from an alternative uh, lender's perspective, if you want to attract capital in today's market from the LPs, you need to have some form of ESG compliance, being it, you know, Article 8 regulated, um, I, there's a clear tendency, so I can comply. And is there more, I mean, interestingly, we've seen because of the sort of things around the Senior Housing and Healthcare Association, which obviously has a, a, a social impact element to it, um, that actually there's a lot more focus from some of the capital on that areas um, in terms of the equity side. Um, so it'd be interesting to see whether that's being matched on the debt side. Is there more of a demand, I suppose, or you know, more of a focus in terms of some of these areas? It may be that senior housing and healthcare are just more attractive at the moment. Um, but is, is there more of a, of a demand for those kind of social um, elements in terms of what you're looking for to finance as well, either from an alternative perspective side or, or from a banking well, side? It, it, it's difficult. I mean, the, the E side of the ESG is very much determined as a taxonomy uh, grid and whatever by the was the first benchmark ever to be applied throughout the market. With the S factor, they, they're working still on it. Uh, with G, mm -hmm. they haven't even started yet, but yeah, <laughs> it, it, is, it is coming and in a certain way imposed on that. And but then we classified some social loans where I said, yeah, you have social housing in there. You have uh, um, those who really give the affordable housing to to those people, and that so these loans you can qualify according to our grid, and to, to according to what we define uh, to be done with that. Okay, good. I mean, interestingly, this is kind of part of our um, outlook for 2024. Sort of pick up on views and. Um, we held one, I think it was three weeks ago, Torsten in, in <coughs> Warsaw, where the evening before it was absolutely beautiful and clear and we were on a similar 26th floor um, and you could see across the whole area, but come the morning um, it was completely clouded in mist. <laughs> um, and they said that but probably by the end of the session um, then the sunlight will come through and everything will be clear. It was still very, very foggy. <laughs> but I did notice that it is clear here today and we very briefly had a bit of sunshine come through yeah. Yeah. about five minutes ago. So well, I no, felt that was probably a positive <laughs> kind of take on what may happen. Richard, on the positive side, mm. yeah, I mean, we are focusing on the negative side, but compared to crisis years ago, I mean, we said uh, capital requirements. I mean, the flip side to it is the banks are much better capitalized than they were in the last crisis. So, um, and, and um, I mean, I hope to be as going to confirm that, but LTVs are also not as high as they were in the last crisis. So I think uh, as a positive side is the market is going much better prepared into whatever is coming next year. Great. Well, I will end on that, yeah. on that positive. <laughs> um, thanks very much to all of our speakers here. Thank you to everybody who's watching online. Um, and uh, because we can, then we're going to applaud ourselves for being here.